Okay, so this is just my intro slide. As Joyce wonderfully pronounced my name, my name's uh, Dr. Diane DeChef, and I've been working at the Writing Center for a long time now, like nine years. And um, around 2017, I launched uh, the science communication course that Joyce mentioned, which is CECOM 314, Communicating Science. I also have a similar one for graduate students, and we're going to be launching two new ones, an advanced version for undergraduates, as well as a second version or a more digitally focused one for graduate students that'll come up, uh, I think, next winter. Um, I was just also going to mention, I don't think this necessarily applies for the case competition, but um, at the Writing Center, we do have our credit courses, but we also have a Writing Center that's online. So that by Writing Center, I mean a tutorial service. So you're welcome to make appointments through the term. I put our little link here. Uh, usually people go in in person. Right now, the meetings are through Teams, but you've already paid for this service through your student fee, so make use of it. And you don't have to have like a really polished draft to go see to go see a tutor. You're welcome to to just um, you know check in with some ideas or an outline or anything like that. So please use it if you if you have any need. All right. So for today, this is our agenda. There's kind of like three main things that we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about what the key needs of audiences are who are not specialists. So we'll kind of contrast uh, scientists like with specialist knowledge versus a broad audience. And for your case competition here, I'm thinking about preparing you for uh, two of the exercises. So this is the more journalistic piece that would go for a broad probably adult audience and then uh, for thinking about children too for writing the children's book I think these things will also be really useful so think about what your audiences need and then how to be compelling in your explanations so how to really you know match what your audience needs in order to do this and then my last couple slides are just sort of if you're looking for other ways to get into science communication besides the case competition which is a wonderful platform to get into it from um, there I have a few more resources that I'll just share with you. All right, so I have these, I think I've hidden this now. Um, I have these word clouds, sorry, I'm just gonna jump around a little bit. I have these word clouds that I created that I'd love to get you going with. Um, and these are going to be, uh, so I can get a sense of who you are and get some input from you right off the top. So I'm just going to put this information uh, into the chat so you can join there. And then I'm just going to activate these. So the first one is just asking, uh, where you learn about science from outside of your field. So if you're looking for, you know, kind of more like the article that you'll be creating when you um, get into doing, I think it's the first part of the case comp, but when you get into writing kind of a more journalistic piece, uh, when you're doing that kind of reading for fun, where are you going? And actually it doesn't even need to be reading. You could also be um, doing work uh, or sorry, doing, you know, gaining your entertainment from something like YouTube or even, you know, Instagram, TikTok, any of those places. So basically I'm just asking you to, um, in this in this cloud sort of let me know what kinds of places you go and if you say things like YouTube maybe even name a channel or a, you know a series that you're interested in it could be a documentary you've recently seen it could be like a news platform that you often read so go ahead and add these ones so I see people starting to fill them in so please please go ahead Okay, they're still popping up, so I'm gonna... Okay, cool, I'm seeing some great ones come up. I'm just going to change my screen share so you can see what I'm seeing, because that will be more interesting for you. Okay, so I'm going to show the responses. Oh no, did I mess it up? <laughs> if I did, I will be so sad. Um, no, this is not what I wanted. There we go. Okay, a 
you seeing what I'm seeing? I will show this up. Oh, get out of there. Okay. All right. So <laughs> looks like YouTube is the big winner here. And um, then a whole bunch of other items. Okay, I see the Ologies podcast, Economist, um, Khan Academy. It looks like they keep been going too. So Twitter, magazines, Instagram. Okay, a wonderful variety of places. Um, I see I see Kill coming up. Hopefully that's part of something else, but who knows exactly. <laughs> okay, so that is awesome. Thank you very much for uh, uh, filling that one out. And then I have one more word cloud to show you or to ask you to complete. Um, and then what is it that you like most? So thinking more about actually doing reading about science, what is it that you like most when you read articles about science that are probably that are not in your specialization? So things that are outside of your specialization. All right, this time you can see things coming up, which is probably a better experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joyce, thanks for your explanation in the chat. Um, this podcast will kill you. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so keep adding these. We're seeing a few. I think simplicity looks like it's a big one. <laughs> ETA, I agree. It does sound a bit risky, that podcast. All right. Okay, so here... Yeah, here we have some pretty uh, great ones. It looks like it's kind of breaking up some of the words. So I see a void. Um, so it might be something that's missing. But uh, so we see things that are like, I love that easy is right in the middle, because this is part of my recommendation to you as the slides go along is to like not tax your audience. And we'll talk a bit about how to avoid that. Um, sensational titles. Okay, that's great to hear you like that. So <laughs> definitely, you know, titles can go a long way. And I, I think it's up to well, your team for the competition to think about where you want to draw the line of being, you know, something people are really eager to dive into and read and for being something that, you know, really represents the science. And hopefully you can find a great way to do both at the same time. Um, but yeah, here we have analogy, something that's straightforward, that there's humor. So I think humor goes a long way, having a more playful tone or having room for, for that kind of, you know, casualness, I think goes a long way. Uh, so there's both figures and pictures. And I think we want to make sure that we're aiming more toward kind of accessible images, things people can, you know, dive into or want to hear more and, and try to avoid like the tables of data kind of thing. Um, all right, so this is great. It's really wonderful to see this one. And um, the third thing that I wanted to, to have you do that's a bit, um, you know, still hearing from you and learning from you is just in terms of thinking about kids books. And I might have a partly selfish reason for, for doing this, but um, so part of the case competition is going to be creating something for kids. I think, is it around 10 years old, Joyce? Is it? What yep. age group? We're yeah, third to fifth grade. Okay, what range is that? Um, is that eight like to 10. Eight to 10, okay, awesome. Um, so I do have a child who's five, so I have a sense of like what younger kids need, but I was just curious about the, the children's books that you might've looked at in recent years, you might've enjoyed as a child. Um, you know, if these are science related, that would be awesome. And if they're just ones that really stick out to you as ones that you thought were super cool when you were a kid, that's great too. Um, they could be both science and ones that you thought were super cool. So what I'd like for you to do is to think for a minute of, you know, a title or even what it was about if you don't totally recall the title it could be a magazine too um, and then put it into the chat and then once you have hopefully everyone's doing this I can't see you all but um, once people have something in the chat I'm going to do a countdown I'll do a three two one countdown and when I say you know send then we'll all send at the same time um, so think of those books think back to your childhood memories peaceful times, hopefully. All right. And then we'll do a three, two, one, and press send. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Magic tree has a magic school bus. Great. These are, yeah, the hungry caterpillar, three little pigs. <laughs> nice. 
Oh, cool. This big book of why looks like it might be one to like take a peek at these days. Um, yeah, the magic school bus ones. I yeah, we're just getting into at our house, and they're pretty awesome. Harry Potter, the Giving Tree. Mm, that one is has some uh, some feminists on the internet are not happy with that one anymore. <laughs> but it's uh, you know, Michelle Stoverstein is such a talented guy. It's a beautiful one. The Good Tree. I'm not sure if I know that one. The Rainbow Fish. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I would urge you, so I think a big part of science communication is thinking about what you like and what you enjoy, because in a lot of ways, you're sort of like your own, you know, you can sometimes be like your own audience or not so dissimilar, except for your sort of specialized knowledge that you want to share. So definitely consider like what you think is good stuff and what would compel you as you go on to create these kinds of things. So, um, you know, you might want to dig a bit deeper into, you know, what it was about some of these books that really jumped out for you. And we're going to do a little activity as we go along where we'll look at an excerpt from Owl Kids magazine. I don't know if people are familiar with that one. It's a Canadian one. Um, but we'll look at sort of like what kinds of of choices the, the authors, the creators of that ma magazine are making in terms of science communication as well. Um, and uh, I'm going to keep this little list in mind, a few of these newer ones in terms of our reading materials around home. Okay, so I'm going to uh, jump back to the slides and share these with you. Oh yeah, okay, we're over to this one. Okay. So this is again a bit interactive. And uh, what I'd like for you to do next is I'm going to just post an image in a second that has text in it. And I'd like you to start reading the text. And um, as you have a kind of a feeling about what you're reading, if you could please put that into the chat. So I'm going to bring that up. So start reading and then let me know what you make of this. You don't have to wait for me to count down. You can just tell me. So add to the chat your feeling as you read it. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> awesome. So we definitely have some people who are knowledgeable about the subject matter here. Some of you are specialists on this topic already. Um, and then the, the rest of the rest of you, the rest of us are saying confused, what, overwhelmed, disengaged, bored, uh, what are some other, yeah, nervous, yeah, it makes me feel kind of like what is going on, lost, what's the context, uh, disorganized, yeah, sad. <laughs> Okay, so this is a, a piece of text I found that was written about cricket, but not just any cricket, a specific match that took place in 1896. So we wouldn't expect most people here to be familiar with this topic already. Um, I think, you know, many of you, I mean, you might have stumbled onto sports writing for a sport that you're not familiar with at different times. For those of you who are familiar with cricket, maybe when you read about some other sports, you're like, what is this sport? But sports writing is wonderfully insidery for people who are on the inside. It's super fun to read because there's all kinds of like verbs and descriptors that are great. Uh, but if you're an outsider to it, and, and unfortunately, I did not I have not still learned that much about cricket. Um, then this, these are, you know, there's verbs like yorked and things like this that I was just like, what is even going on? So the reason for showing this to you is to, to give you a sense of, um, maybe you feel this often enough, but um, maybe not about the science that you know most about, to give you a sense of what it's like to kind of be, be a bit lost in a topic and the, the terrible ex experience that can happen for those of us who don't know enough about a topic and we're asked to do a lot of work as audience members to just kind of figure it out. So it's missing context. We need to have things made easier for us as audience members to follow. So 
we'll get into now sort of the key needs of general audiences versus science audiences or specialist audiences. Um, so the kinds of work that you'll be doing for the review paper or the review article component of the case comp are where you still need to be thinking about what scientists need, what kinds of information are going to be most important for scientists or researchers who are interested in this topic. And there are definitely, you know, things that are super important to include. So making sure that there's the kinds of precise and specific vocabulary that scientists use, that there's quick access to key information. People don't have to read through paragraphs searching for certain you know, key pieces of data, that the figures are, are there and that they, they're they you know, properly constructed if they're, as I'm sure they're still valuable in most of the review articles, and that an anticipated structure is met. Um, so this is where you know, looking at models, having a good sense of how review articles usually are put together is going to be super important. Now, on the other hand, non-scientists or non-specialists, in order to feel included and engaged by information, um, they're going to need to feel like they're not outsiders, but that they've been you know, brought into the fold as the, the topic is being communicated to them, that they're being connected with. They need to have to do as little work as possible. So it should almost feel like it's you know, some new insights that are almost like invisibly coming to us. And that's where it's like such nice science communication or like, yeah, and learning new stuff and it feels good. Um, and a way of doing that is by feeling sort of human and sensory elements. Um, most, you know, most conversations, most of what we do for entertainment has these kinds of components and we can make sure these are included. And it takes some work to move from like a journal article to have these sorts of more human and sensory components. So we'll talk a bit more about those as we go on. And also we want to recognize sort of more storied structure. So even with a news article about science that we'd be reading, there, there are certain elements that we look for as we read those, even if we couldn't necessarily name them off the top, the, they exist. And as readers, we have anticipations. And when we're going through text, we wanna be hitting those things or else we get confused. We're kind of like, what is going on? So there's a couple studies I'll point to here about ways to be more inclusive with your science readers. And by inclusive, I'm not even talking about like equity, diversity and inclusion. I'm just talking about like making sure people can follow and wanna keep reading. Um, so there's one about jargon that came out, I think this was published in 2020. So it's quite a recent art article. And what these researchers found was that um, the language in article in in like news articles if it was more accommodating so if it was letting readers just sort of you know read in what they're used to reading the kind of language they're used to using it was much easier for them to continue reading and that they also found that actually defining terms like putting definitions in parentheses or you know kind of explaining the meaning of things in kind of a didactic kind of educational way often put people off too they were less likely to keep reading then um, and the reason is that when when we sort of um, show that we have this language and that we can use it uh, and we sort of delve out what are maybe specialized words, it can tell people that they don't really belong, that as readers, this wasn't really meant for them. And it's a bad feeling to have a little like when, you know, we might have been reading about a, you know, more than 100 year old cricket match and we aren't familiar with the sport. Um, so we want people to feel like they belong. And certainly those specialized words are super important when you're communicating with specialists. And through much of our undergraduate careers, we are focused on showing how we know those terms. We're focused on writing up and impressing our professors, our TAs, even our peers that we like get the lingo, we can talk like this. And we need to be able to do that to get our degrees. But to, to do strong science communication, we need to be able to communicate outward more bilaterally with people who aren't necessarily in those same groups and who don't want to hear us using these specialized terms in the same way. So what I'll show you here, or for example one and example two, I'll just show you these are the two versions that were used in this study. So take a read through and tell me which one is easier. You can type this into the chat as you read these through. So which one's the easiest one? Okay, awesome. We're getting scads of twos. Thank you. No question there. 
Um, so if you worked in this field or if you were one of the people who had developed um, you know, these systems, these terms motion scaling and tremor reduction probably are very meaningful for you. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. But the authors of this revised text in number two have done a nice job of explaining what those things mean without ever telling us there is a specialist term. So we can see you know, what, what motion scaling and tremor reduction mean are that the robot's movements are more precise and less shaky. So that's the kind of shifting that we want to do where it's like, yeah, this is how I would probably talk to a friend about it, um, as opposed to like showing off to them that, that I know these words that they don't know. And that's what we need to keep doing in our science communication. So yeah, here is the jargon version and the no jargon version. All right, so the same researchers had another finding from this study that they did, and this was all done online. So they had people reading different pieces of text and then talking about their experience with reading about them. And what they found in the second study or the second kind of outcome of the study is that if it was difficult to make sense of this, of this reading, then there was less buy-in. So people were less likely to believe the content of the article. So it wasn't just that they were like, oh, it's not for me. They were actually like, I don't think I believe what this article is saying. So jargon led people to not believe the science that was being shared. And there's a quote from the author that says, when you have a difficult time making sense of something, you're more likely to start to counter argue. So this, you know, I feel like this outcome um, is super important to think about our responsibility as science communicators in that, you know, if we make things harder to understand, people are less likely to believe us. So, you know, this is especially, you know, in the context of the current pandemic, that's a big deal. So we want to make sure that we're making things accommodating. We're making things in the language people are accustomed to using. And actually one way to make sure, and this is kind of along the same lines, is to just avoid using abbreviations. So there's certain abbreviations that we throw around, something like AI for artificial intelligence. Um, you know, we might expect a certain level of audience to be familiar with that, but we don't want to expect that all children know AI. I think we can expect, like I think the, um, the CBC and the New York Times use AI or they use T-Rex. So those are like common abbreviations that we can expect. But here's um, here's one, I'll just click on this one. And yeah, you can see my screen still. So this is from Massive Science, which is a great organization I'll actually recommend at the end. But I wasn't so impressed by this one article that they put together. So this is an article that's talking about a new machine that can easily translate brain activity into written sentences. Sounds pretty cool. Um, and then they use this term, so they introduce it properly like we would in academic writing, brain machine interfaces or BMIs. Um, I'm kind of like, okay, I got it. Um, and then right away they start talking about it as BMIs. Now to me, this is okay, except what does BMI mean to you if you haven't read this article before? Is there something that BMI sort of prompts? Yeah, body mass index, me too. And I was like, at first I was kind of like, oh yeah, it doesn't mean that. And I kept kind of going back up and using it. And then I noticed that even in this pull quote, so this might be what catches people's attention and brings them to read, it's using BMI and not sort of a different version. So to what I would suggest, instead of just using the same, and this is for when you're writing for broad audiences, if you're writing for specialists, of course, keep using your acronyms, introduce them properly, keep using them, they're great shorthand. But when you're writing for broad audiences, and especially if you're not sure, like for the kids, especially, we don't want to be using abbreviations that are unfamiliar with them. So instead of using BMI all the time, I would talk about like these machine interfaces or these interfaces and kind of vary how I refer to it. But I wouldn't want people to have to scroll back up. That's more work for the reader. So we want to avoid doing that. Awesome. I'm going to keep going on with these slides. Sorry, I just need to make them look appropriate again. Are they kind of cut off on your screen right now? Yeah, okay. Okay, so 
Another big goal for us, so besides making things easier by avoiding jargon and abbreviations, the other thing I guess this is more constructive is to make sure that the science that you write about is relatable. And by that, I mean to use more sort of human and sensory elements when you describe it. So in a lot of, um, a lot of scientific writing, a lot, often the scientists aren't really discussed or mentioned and they're just kind of absent like they're clearly the people who wrote the article but in some disciplines they wouldn't even be described describing themselves as we they would just you know clearly they're the people who created this but we wouldn't see them at all and this is changing some fields like biology there's more reference to the group of researchers they might say i or we um, but traditionally a lot of science was written without sort of authors naming themselves but when we write in science in science communication in science journalism we want to really humanize the scientists as well as the science that they're writing about. So just take a read through this excerpt that was written by Ed Young. And once you've read through it, type a word or a phrase into the chat box that stands out to you or that's something that like kind of sticks with you about the article, something that maybe makes this researcher Bob Payne more human. Yeah, thank you, Claire. So the end quote where we hear from Bob himself, where he's like, you get pretty good at throwing starfish into deeper water. Yeah, there's voice in the text. Absolutely. Yeah, it seems like he has an amusing personality. Um, the active voice for sure. Sucker lined, yeah, is great. Simply wasn't enough. It does sound personal. Yeah, the powerful grip, the struggle with the sea star, absolutely. So we're sort of hearing Bob Payne described to us and he's like this big fellow, but then we also see him almost in contrast with the sea stars. Yeah, the adverbs go a long way, don't they? Thank you, Geneva. Yeah, it sounds more like a story. Absolutely. Why is he throwing starfish? I know. Um, so he is the biologist, I suppose, who termed the phrase the keystone species. Some of you are probably familiar with this. And this article by Ed Young does something that's interesting. It traces sort of his academic footprint as sort of like an academic family tree, like the people who studied with Bob Payne and then the people who studied with those people. And it sort of shows like sort of his um, effects or his impacts within his field. And him throwing the starfish was a bit about identifying the sea star as one of the these keystone species, so sort of the effects that they have their, within their different ecologies. Um, but I know it doesn't sound nice for the fish or for the, the starfish. All right. Um, so a focus here and something that we'll see in some of the other examples is that we always want to hear quotes from scientists themselves. We want to hear their own voices, not in sort of academies. So not how they would write their, their journal articles, but how they would speak with somebody, speak with a reporter, speak with you, speak with their families. Um, and when we describe them in science journalism, we want to describe them as very human. Even if they're in their lab, we want to describe sort of like what they might be thinking or feeling, what they might be smelling, you know, sort of where they're standing, like all those kinds of things. We want to be able to picture them. So that's something to focus on for sure for your for your articles. Now this is just a thinking. So the two places that I'm going to have you kind of thinking about here are about structure. So how you structure your articles, which order you put pieces in, and then some of the stylistic choices you make along the way. So definitely the stuff around word choice, um, like jargon, and then sort of these more human or sensory elements, those are more stylistic decisions. But here we're going to think a bit more about the kind of structure. So when we work with journal articles, um, there's a very standard structure that's in place. And this was one that was agreed upon in the 1970s and basically almost every research article since then has used these same components, these same um, 
pieces in the same order. So this is often referred to as IMRAD. So I for introduction, M for methods, um, R for results, and then there'd be an A or letter A that's just tossed in there, and then D for discussion. So this is the, the normal sequence you will find in journal articles. And this is handy because it's almost like a, a file cabinet that the researchers are like, this is the piece we put in here. So if somebody else wants to know, you know about methods, they can just go to that section, open up that drawer and get the details that they need. They don't have to read the whole thing. Um, and so that's, you know, part of why this it's like a shorthand It's like the map is laid out for everyone, everyone can go and access these things in the same way. So scientists need that, we look for that, it's a time saver, it's awesome. But when we're translating from the journal articles to, um, you know, a cool piece of writing that people will be compelled by, we need to think much more about narrative structure. So we need to think about, is there tension? Is there a question that's being asked that we want to, to understand? Um, we want to hear about scenes. We almost want to hear potentially sort of like a, there doesn't need to be like a narrator, but we want to hear some kind of voice potentially, like who's writing this, how do they fit in, or who's being described. Um, often we want to hear a resolution. Sometimes these things just follow more of a chronology. So in a research article, we don't really see a chronology. We don't see sort of like past, present, future, but in stories we do. And people look for that. They want to see how things are organized. And one of the most common ways to organize stories is chronologically. So people look to it. So we want to think about that kind of structure. And I'll just show you the kind of standard structure. So we'll come to this one next. Um, that's used is one that um, is, is generally, well, I'll show you in a second the details of it. So this is me, I think these are, I'm getting ahead of myself, I guess, but the structure um, is where we're looking for kind of the standard structure or what we expect. Um, and then we can think about what we might expect in a children's story versus what we look for in a, you know, in a newspaper, in a science article in a newspaper. And a key thing is to always look closely at models. So those kids books that you mentioned earlier, you might want to go back to some of the ones that you enjoyed and just look at the order that things were put together, you know, especially thinking of that sort of narrative arc, how are we things moving in time. I know some of those have time travel, so that's always kind of like, how does that work? Um, but just sort of think about how things are structured. Is there sort of a setting described in the opening? You know, how are you brought into the story? And so I have this idea of the sort of x-ray goggles in that you want to analyze those model texts in terms of structure and in terms of style. So we'll talk a bit more about how that goes. So this was a slide I thought was coming next when I felt a bit confused for a second. Um, this is the standard structure for a, a more journalistic piece of writing about science, like the explainer article. Uh, and it has what we call, this is, these are sort of journalism school terms, but it has what's called a lead. And this is also known as like a hook or an image or sort of a scene that draws the reader in. And then it usually has what's called a nut graph. And this is, you know, kind of just like the story's topic or the story's focus. Um, and the nut graph term comes from like the, the sort of the story in a nutshell. And it's one short paragraph that does that job. So people are drawn in, they have a sense of what this is going to be about, and then they keep reading. And then these pieces here that I have in sort of giant parentheses are meant to be like, like these are things that should be covered, maybe not all of them always, but most of them. And it's more up to you as the authors to think about what order these should go in. So these don't have to be in this specific order. Um, you do want some kind of great ending or callback at the end. And then you also want to have an awesome title off the top that's going to pull people in. And something that I talk to students about is this idea of having an ending that bookends the beginning. So if the beginning was, um, you know, open with a certain scene, you might want to call back to it or you might want to relate back to it. Often having that sort of link between the beginning and the end makes your reader feel kind of smart that they remember what happened at the beginning and they're like, oh, nice link. So think about that. It's not essential, but it's something that can really help. Um, and I'll make sure you get these slides, but this um, these links are to the Open Notebook, which is an awesome resource for science communication, especially science journalism. And um, they give you some, some good suggestions for crafting some of these pieces of your article. 
All right, so you always want to write in a style. So moving away from structure now and thinking more about those stylistic decisions, um, you always want to write in a style that's appropriate for your audience. And so it's super important to sort of get to know your audience, to think about how they currently talk about this topic. So when you're doing your sort of research for the children's book, talk to some kids. If you can, you know, have a chance to, to speak with some children that are in this age group, you know, see how they talk about the topic that you want to discuss with them or you want to connect with them about. Out. Um, and then think about what images might work well for kids or for for adults with your um, you know with the more journalistic piece that you'll write and if you need metaphors which metaphors would be effective what do you think would be helpful here uh, and these are some more suggestions for what to consider in terms of stylistic components. So one can be around varying sentence structure. So in academic writing, we tend to use longer sentences and we tend to stick with sort of varied versions of longer sentences. In journalism, you'll see that there are, there's a lot more variety of sentence lengths and people sometimes ask questions with a question mark, uh, you know, depending on where things are published, sometimes we'll even say an exclamation mark. Um, we also see verbs playing a big role. Verbs move things along in your sentences and, and uh, in academic writing there's a lot more nouns. Nouns are sort of like plucked in or grouped together and it, they can be sometimes hard to wade through um, but we want to make sure the verbs we use are really powerful. So we often use these ones like to do, to make, to have, to be but try to use verbs in your writing both your academic writing and your journalistic writing and especially for the kids book verbs that are going to like create a more of an image, create more of a sense um, so as an example, I could I can say like, I'm going to go make the coffee. But if instead I say I'm going to brew coffee, the verb to brew is a bit more interesting. And then if I say the coffee's percolating, like percolation, that's kind of a fabulous word, you know, so there's the, these choices that it's basically the same thing. But we have, you know, different sorts of feelings in our body as we read those words as we connect with them. Um, so we already talked a little about making science a scientist human and relatable. And as much as possible, we want to do that with the science too. We don't want it to seem abstract and just like, I'm not sure who that affects or why, but you know, we want that to be as close to the reader as it can be. And then we want to think about different literary devices that might help. So I mentioned hyperbole off the top. We probably want to stay away from hyperbole uh, unless, you know, there's a really good reason for it. And that's when, you know, it's kind of like an extreme description. But metaphors can be really helpful for uh, making um, explanations connect to what people already are familiar with and already know. And then alliteration. So when we hear kind of repetition of especially the beginning of words, if they have the same kind of text, we see that a lot in titles. And it can just be kind of a playful thing, especially with the kids book. And we also want to make sure our our register, so the level of formality that we use, uh, it also changes. With our academic writing, we want to keep it fairly formal, but we need to crank that back when we're writing for broad audiences and for children. And, you know, if there's a bit of fun, a bit of humor, somebody else mentioned that in the word cloud, that's going to be more powerful. Okay, so now I'm just going to um, grab a link to an activity that we'll do next. I'm just going to plot this uh, link in the box and if you can open this up and then I'm going to share with you. I'm just going to open up this uh, same thing, and I'll explain it to you here. Okay, are people getting their way into that link? Are you able to open it? Joyce, were you able to open it? Great, awesome. Okay, so I'm just gonna, oh yeah, I can see your cursor's popping up now, awesome. So I'm just gonna show you this. So what this is, is I'll just scroll down and you can do the same obviously, but there's two pieces of writing. One is, it's about ice, an iceberg and it's written for adults. It was published in the New York Times in 2019. And uh, within that piece, I've made sections. So if your first name starts with an A, B, C, D, or E, this will be your section that you'll be looking at. And we can spend time and go through them all afterward, but um, I just want you to find where your section is. The second section, so if your name starts with any of these letters, F, G, H, I, or J, then you'll be focusing on this one. And you're going to be doing kind of a stylistic analysis. 
the third section. Um, so if your first name begins with K, L, M, N, or O, jump down here. And then this is the second piece of text that's written for children. And um, this is one that was published in Owl magazine. Oh, some people are already at work. You're amazing. People whose name starts with S. So P, Q, R, S, or T, this is what you're looking for. And then, oh, you're already finding it. So if your name begins with any of the six last letters of the alphabet, jump down to the very last section. So what I'd like you to do is to use the highlighting tool uh, in Office 365. So you should see it up at the top. It's this tool here, and you'll see these same colors. Um, and so where you see images that have been crafted with words, highlight in yellow in your section, where you see ways that science or scientists have been made more human or relatable, highlight in green. If you see new terms shared, but also sort of defined in context without sort of a proper definition being offered, please highlight in this sort of turquoise, lighter blue. If you see good verbs, dark, darker blue. Uh, literary devices, so metaphors, alliteration, so that repeated sound um, highlight in pink. And then if you see sort of play or humor, highlight in red, please. So we'll just take maybe four, three or four minutes to do this. And then we'll kind of do a quick scroll and see what people came up with. Okay, so I saw some excellent work happening here. So thanks for your uh, stylistic analysis. And by the way, the way, the same way that we're going through and looking at this for style, you can do the same kind of thing for structure. So you can go through and sort of read closely a newspaper article on, you know, maybe something kind of similar to what you'd like to craft or one that you find is particularly good. And just go through and highlight what you think are those same sort of structural elements. So you have a sense of how those work and how they fall in the text. Okay. So I guess nobody was assigned the title, but um, I do I do find this title to be uh, quite humorous. I find it to be a, a pretty great one. Um, so a huge iceberg split from Antarctica, they just grew apart. So it's this sort of personification of the relationship between the iceberg and Antarctica. And then people did a great job. I can see that, you know, I love this sort of like, it's both red and green <laughs> coming through off the top. So this is great to see. Um, so we can see some of these verbs, the images, um, how we saw all, like um, things made more human and relatable. And I love like here, this, this highlighted red and green, this is not to do with any sort of seasonal times, but that this is something kind of playful. So maybe a bit like Star Wars, like C-3PO or R2-D2. Um, so we have this robotic sounding name, D28 or D28, that is both relatable as well as playful, the way that this has been inserted. So these are great. And then in terms of thinking about um, more things that are, um, so images, we have a good sense here of the size. So this glacier is, you know, a little bit bigger than Oahu, Hawaii. Um, and here we have this definition. So so it talks about the calving event and then it says the technical term for the split. And so to me, this is a fine way to introduce a new term because it's not saying like, hey, idiot, you don't know what this means, do you? But instead it's like a natural flow to it where you know, within a very short period, you do know what that means. So you might be like calving, but then you know, very quickly you are aware of what it is. So I think that one's effective. I'm not sure if other people feel differently if that feels sort of exclusive, but I think that one is doing okay. 
All right. So we have here um, this slightly purple one. Is this, I think maybe it's like the literary devices. Is that kind of what people were going for there? Because I think this is a really great sort of comparison. So a simile, like not cutting your hair, I think works very well. Um, yeah, and here's another sort of this cork in the champagne bottle. So I found this article particularly metaphor rich. There were quite a quite a few uh, metaphors happening in it, and um, I'm just going to scroll down to where the kids stuff was happening. And if people want to ask questions or have things they want to point out, feel free to do that too. Yeah, so here's a bit of alliteration, frozen fact. So that's a nice one to include. Um, and we have this playful, like every person in Newfoundland could have their own iceberg in the world. And so we have, you know, floating incredible icebergs is a bit of alliteration also. And then this bergy bit or growler. So these are other words for things smaller than icebergs. Um, yeah, and this is sort of relatable too. So icebergs are mysterious. We can never be sure when they might show up or, or vanish and then crash and drift are some great verbs to how to tow them. Yeah, so this is a great image also besides being kind of humorous. All right, so thank you for these. Um, people have questions about it. Is there anything that sort of jumps out at you that's weird or things you wanted to, to ask about with it? So I think this kind of like, you know, putting on your sort of analyzing eyes and looking at a, some at some models before you do these these um, projects I think would be really helpful they would be it would be really powerful for you to spend a little bit of time looking at some of those things and seeing what you like and how you might want to sound to your audience okay so we're, we're rolling down to our last 10 minutes of uh, our presentation so I'm just going to pull up the slides again and we can move on to my final uh, components. Okay, awesome. So I just wanted to tell you, we already read a little bit by Ed Young, but he's definitely one of my um, favorite science journalist. I'm not sure if other people are reading him as well, um, but I wanted to mention kind of ways that um, science communication can be creative. And so I have this example um, from, from Ed Young. So this creative component, science communication has a lot of room for you to um, draw on some of your creative muscles that you might not get to use all the time within your more academic writing. But um, the ways that you choose to engage senses, uh, create sort of vivid images with words is important, the sort of storytelling, and especially thinking about creative structure can be really powerful. And I just wanted to show you this one article. So this is the opening of it that was written by Ed Young. So he's talking about um, this fellow and it's the first time in the wild anyone has ever attached a heart monitor um, to a blue whale. So we have this picture of this happening. And then when Ed Young writes about it, he does this thing. So I'll just let you read it through first. We actually can't see the. Um, oh, you can't see the slide. You're sharing. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Thank you for telling me. You're like, I'd love to, but. We'll use our imagination. Um, let me just try that again. Screen share. Can you see it now? Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Great. So here, do you see a picture of this, of this blue whale? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then here's what I wanted you to read. So what I think is creative, and Ed Young is a creative science journalist for sure, what I think is creative is that he's chosen to structure this whole piece in these kind of longish 
paragraphs that are meant to take, you know, the average reader about the same amount of time to read as it would take for the whale's heart to beat. Um, so it gives us a, you know, a physical sense of something that he's writing about. So it's pretty cool. It's sort of this like twofold way of communicating with readers, which I definitely appreciated. And there's some other cool stylistic elements that Ed Young is known for, but I thought that one was particularly interesting. So hopefully what we've talked about so far has given you a good sense of sort of the general, the needs of a general audience and maybe even a bit around a child, like a kid audience and children as audience. Um, and then some ideas about how to be, you know, compelling and how to sort of engage readers differently than what we might do in academic writing. So I just wanted to, to end with a couple of slides about sort of like where and how else to do this. Um, so some of you might already be doing all kinds of cool science communication and I would actually, you know, I'd love to hear about your projects if I haven't heard about them yet. So at the end, I'll give you my email if you want to drop me a line or communicate on Twitter. Um, but here are some places to kind of get going. So one of them is to just check out this hashtag SciComm. So it's used on uh, Instagram and on Twitter a lot. And you'll see, I mean, it's only as good as the people who are using it, but you'll see a lot of different things posted there. And if you are sharing science communication on those interfaces and you want more readers, I would urge you to use that hashtag because a lot of people check it out and retweet things related to it. Um, pitching to a student paper. So both the McGill Daily and the McGill Tribune are great places to get into writing about science and technology. Um, I think they're both awesome in that you can learn a lot and the editors are knowledgeable and they can work with you to really develop good stories. So I think it's a great place to sort of begin to build a portfolio. Um, if you're more interested in podcasting, uh, volunteering with community, community radio um, at McGill, we have CKUT and um, even though there's a pandemic on, there's still things to do that would be helpful for some of the different radio programs. So it's worth checking those out. Uh, one of my colleagues, Rakib Tesve, she's just finishing her PhD in neuroscience, but she's been running a podcast called Broad Science out of CKUT for several years, many years, since she was a master's student. And she just got started there by volunteering. And it's like, you know, she's actually now a, a CBC radio reporter who talks about science on the radio and is doing that maybe right now. So um, it's a pretty cool sort of place to go. There's also, and actually for those of you who are interested, there's um, the, the communications officer for the faculty of science has let me know that he would love to be working with students to produce more science content. So you can reach out to me and I can put you in touch with him. Um, and that's for the Faculty of Science website. So if you're looking for another place to sort of have publications, um, the Office for Science and Society is also interested in student writing, especially if it's like opinion pieces, then you can go there too. And also having individual websites, blogs, Twitter feeds, these kinds of things can be really great ways to get started. Or Instagram feeds, I was thinking of more with like descriptive captions that are more science communication oriented can be really great too. And some departments too, and I know your student groups within different departments are often, you know, doing a lot of cool writing. So those would all be good places. Uh, this next slide, these are more organizations that are geared toward graduate students, which probably many of you will be eventually. Um, yes, Joyce, I was thinking that too. Is, do you want to, maybe at the end, you can just mention that too, if you want to talk about the space. Um, yeah, about the, the McGill Science Writing Initiative as a potential host for your writing too. Um, but these sites do a lot of great publications around science and they're worth checking out even at the undergrad stage, but they're definitely places that as grad students, you can become more involved. And at the bottom here, I just have these resources. So the open notebook is the one that had the definitions of like lead and nut graph and so on. They have so much good stuff and it's all free. So it's really worth checking that one out. And then the op-ed project is great if you're doing more persuasive writing. If you're interested in opinion pieces, then this uh, is a really great project that's meant to increase the number of bylines written by um, people of color and women because it, there's been um, too few um, publications of opinions from, from um, people who aren't white men. So it's definitely a place to, to check out sort of tools for doing this. All right, so this is basically the closing. I will share the link to these slides in one second before I sign off, because there's also some good resources. So some good sample articles that I would recommend looking at, some longer form ones that are some of my favorites. Um, and then this fellow, Roy Peter Clark, is a really awesome journalism instructor at, or instructor at the Pointer Institute in the United States. So he's worth looking at too. 
Um, and then there's a mention of CCOM 314 here. And on Twitter, I have this un kind of sort of strange handle that's at and then nomencultured. But anyway, I'll drop the slide. So feel, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, I always follow back. So um, I can see you around there. And I do share mostly science communication stuff. So I would uh, enjoy uh, sharing things with you there.